I am 75 years old and nearing the end of my life. My two grandsons, Dylan and Alexander, eight years old and five, Not yet. are just beginning theirs. Oh, about, about five more stops. One day in Miami, at a museum of the city's history, we were walking through exhibits of Florida's original population. When Dylan asked, so where are the Indians now? He wanted to know, and after all these years, can we visit them? My first thought was the Seminole Indians out there in the Everglades. Then it occurred to me, wait a minute, Dylan, you already know some Indians. Who? Your brother Alex, I said, and your mother, and you too, are descendants of the Taino Indians because your abuelo, Pedro, your other grandfather is from the Dominican Republic. He surely has Taino DNA, just like you and the very first people Columbus met in 1492. In fact, it is estimated that as much as 18% of the current population of the Dominican Republic has Taino DNA. Its capital, Santo Domingo, was also the capital of old Hispaniola, it was where Cortez arrived from Spain in 1504, and it was where, as part of this film about Cortez and Mexico, that I went with the kids to this, the oldest European city in the New World. Its international airport is called, simply, Las Americas. Traveling with Dylan and Alex was their mother, Katie. Though born in Miami, she has been here many times. Her dad, Pedro... Abuelo to the grandkids was born in Santo Domingo. For the boys, however, it was their first time, more than 50 years after my first visit to Italy, where my grandparents were born. It was the summer of 65. I was traveling on my own for the first time, and all alone, but for whatever reason that year, I was 20 at the time, I had no plans at all to visit Venice, Italy's most iconic city. I had stopped in Florence and Pisa and Milan in Siena. I was there for the famous Palio. I had gone as far south as Naples and Pompeii. But the whole point of that summer's journey in 65 was yes to see and experience Rome, Caput Mundi, capital of the ancient world, but also there was again that odd nostalgia for something missing, something never experienced, impossible to experience, the ancient world itself. I stayed in Rome at, of all places, the Salvation Army Hotel, behind the train station. It's still there. And so from there, one morning, leaving new friends behind, never to see them again, I set out for the Autostrada del Sole to hitchhike. I was picked up by two Italian architects in a Volkswagen. They were going to Trieste on the Yugoslav border, and they would, if I liked, drop me off in Venice. In fact, I had no choice. They insisted I had to see Venice. And because Venice was so off my radar in 65, I was just blown away. So completely so, in fact, that as I then understood, and believe even now, it is impossible to understand Venice from films or from photographs, that there is no way to anticipate Venice. To understand Venice, you have to be there. You have to see it for yourself. You simply have to go. This is Piazza San Marco. If Napoleon once did call it the drawing room of Europe, I have lingered myself many hours here, and perhaps you have also. But how many of us have ever been to Venice of the New World, to Tenochtitlan, I mean to say? Do you even know where it is? Does it even still exist? Well, yes it does, and no, it does not.
And so, stranded somehow between yes and no, we are here, some 6,000 miles from the old world of Venice on the Adriatic in Mexico City, the living ghost of Tenochtitlan. To the Aztecs, it was their Capit Mundi, their capital city of the world. And this, behind me, the National Palace, the political center of modern Mexico, was built on the site of, and with the demolished remains, of the palace of Moctezuma, the Aztec sovereign. The Spanish called him Montezuma, and there are many versions of the name, but in Mexico today, Moctezuma is most common. So let's just say that it was here, July 29, in 1520, in his very own palace, that Moctezuma was murdered, as some would say, by the hand of Hernán Cortés himself. That this could have happened at all is amazing. That it happened in little over a year after Cortés had landed on the Gulf Coast of Mexico in April of 1519 is astonishing. Five hundred years later, in March of 2019, I am here where it all began, on the Gulf Coast in Veracruz, during Mardi Gras week, no less. And given the animosity, severe hatred even, in 1519, that the locals here had toward Moctezuma and the Aztecs, at least as Cortes tells us, the exuberance with which this port city today celebrates its Christian heritage is totally apropos, indeed. 14 months after Hernán Cortés planted the true cross here in Mexico in 1519, Moctezuma, the pagan emperor, was dead. Very soon thereafter, Tenochtitlan, his capital city, his Capit Mundi, would fall to the Spanish, and with it, all of Mexico. It was the beginning of a near total, wanton destruction of an entire civilization. And make no mistake about it, the palace of Moctezuma was not a thatched hut. It was, by all accounts, multi-storied and built of the finest stone and wood materials. Yet, like everything else in Tenochtitlan, it is simply gone, not here anymore. It would be as if in 1520, Venice and Italy had slipped beneath the tide of history. Yet of Tenochtitlan, other than a few artifacts and some broken temples, all we have left are words. And amongst these words, we are lucky to have those of Bernal Diaz. Bernal Diaz del Castillo. He was there with Cortes, one of his captains during the conquest. But it was not until some 40 years later, retired to his hacienda in Guatemala, that he began his version of what had happened there in Mexico. And in 1995, when I finally made it to Mexico City exactly 30 years after my momentous experience of Venice, Italy, it was this book by Diaz that I carried with me and read the true story of the conquest of New Spain. To me, still the most exciting account that we have, it is not the only account. We also have the five letters that Cortes dutifully sent to his king, Charles of Spain, which though composed during the conquest, comprise a much more formal record than that of Diaz. And also, as we now know, because he was writing to justify his unconventional and sometimes insubordinate actions in Mexico and to curry favor with the king, Cortes simply omits many details relating to others in his command. In his account, the singular personal pronouns, I and me, dominate. This Cortes-centric narrative is, however, supported by another of our sources, Francisco López de Gomera, the conquistador's official biographer. But he was also, in fact, a friend of Cortes, and he was running from Seville, never at all having been to Mexico. Yet, according to him, to Gomera, the success of the conquest was owed solely to the wisdom and agency of Cortes, who himself, we must also add here, only once in all his letters to Spain, mentions his translator, and never by name, La Malinche, an Indian woman with whom he had at least one child. Diaz, on the other hand, and to his credit, more than once stops his narrative to pay tribute to this woman, to La Malinche, emphasizing that they could not have done what they did in Mexico without her. Thus, to counter what he considered this lopsided narrative, Bernal Diaz, 40 years later, 
titled his account The True Story of the Conquest of New Spain, where he added many more names to the story than Cortes could admit to. We also have the work of Bartolomé de las Casas, a Dominican friar who knew Mexico well. He, in fact, had a decidedly caustic view of Hernán Cortés and would later, importantly, become an apologist for the Indians. But he was not present on the ground during the conquest. Thus it was Hernán Cortés and Bernal Díaz who have left us two of the most complete eyewitness accounts of the conquest. It is upon them that we rely for our story, as in fact this is more a story than history. If there is any such thing as history, does anyone really know everything exactly of what happened yesterday, for example? But if we do approximate history here, it will be more in line with the original meaning of the word, of inquiry, of investigation, of wonder, of wondering why, for example, and most importantly to me, why in 1521 did Hernán Cortés completely obliterate Aztec culture and Tenochtitlan in particular? Luckily, we have here behind me, in Chapultepec Park, in Mexico City, the fabulous National Museum of Anthropology. In fact, most of the material evidence of Aztec culture in Mexico is preserved in museums like this one in Chapultepec. Built in the 1960s, it is the premier museum in all of Mexico. And as we walk past the stunning artifacts here, and later, as we travel La Ruta Cortez from Veracruz to the capital, we must ask ourselves this. About that momentous meeting in 1519 between Cortez and Moctezuma, the climax of a long trek inland by the Spanish, what actually happened there on that causeway leading into Tenochtitlan? Was it simply a meeting of two men eyeing one another, assessing strengths and weaknesses? It certainly was that. But was it not also the meeting of two worlds, the dominant powers of two halves of the planet, Castilian Spain and Aztec Mexico, a clash of civilizations, in fact, unlike anything this planet has seen to date, and, short of an alien invasion, will never see again. How well I do remember my first reading of Diaz, especially his description of when they first caught sight of the imperial city. They had just climbed to a high mountain pass, where I am now, between two volcanoes. Today it is called El Paso de Cortes, about 30 miles southeast of the city. But the city is not visible from here. It was not until the following day, and some miles later, descending, that they first caught sight of Tenochtitlan. Forty years later, sitting in his hacienda in Guatemala, Diaz memorialized that first impression. The next morning, we reached the broad high road Vistalapan, whence for the first time we beheld the numbers of towns and villages built in the lake, and the still greater number of townships on the mainland, and the level causeway run running straight, straight into, into Tenochtitlan. Our astonishment was raised to the highest pitch, and indeed, we could not help but turn and remark to one another that all of these buildings and palaces resembled the castles we had read about in fairy tales. So high and so majestic and so splendid were the temples and towers and the houses of the city, all built of massive stone, rising up out of the lake, that many of us believed we were living in a dream. I am here with two actors, Bob Gonzalez and Petrus Gregorius, who will capture for us Bernal Diaz and Hernán Cortés as we rehearse for what will be a staged version of this documentary. Okay, so. We were as if living in a dream, he said. Indeed, it could well have been a dream, because in fact, in 1521, immediately after the conquest and preparation for the Mexico City we see today, Cortés, with 150,000 men, likely all slaves, leveled the Aztec capital, and with the rubble, filled in all its canals. It took less than two months. Meanwhile, in Italy, hundreds of years more ancient, the canals of Venice are still available to us to see, to experience, to wander in, to wander in. Thus, the wonder of my first steps into the island city of Venice in 1965 was matched in 1995 by an overwhelming sense of loss, because from the very men who destroyed it, 
we know that Tenochtitlan was, like Venice, a city of innumerable islands that seemed as if floating, mirage-like, not on a lagoon as in Venice, but on a grand lake system dominated by Lake Texcoco, and that all of these islands were interlaced with canals, with bridges here and there, or with crossings like this one and with many of the outlying islands lined with well-tended gardens like these, still extant in Xochimilco. Today it is just a small chunk of a giant megapolis. In pre-Hispanic times, however, Xochimilco was a city unto itself. But even as a mere shadow of its better days, a day spent here is to partake of the true wonder of human ingenuity, of artifice, to partake of a dreamlike world of wildlife and islands, islands that not only seem to float, but do in fact float. They were called chinampas by the Aztecs and still call that today, patches of earth that draw sustenance from the lake and which, in Aztec times, supplied the city with much of its food. Sadly, the lake system is mostly gone now, intentionally drained away by the Spanish, because of recurring flooding, they claimed, but in direct contradiction to successful water management practiced for centuries here by the original peoples. Indeed, to pass a day here is such a beguiling invitation to time travel through the rhythms of the pre-Columbian mind that it is difficult not to succumb to the sadness of sensing the presence of what we will never be able to see. This true sadness is to me the true story of the conquest and destruction of old Mexico, and it is what we are about today as we dance with Cortez from here, Veracruz, his city, the city of the True Cross, to Tenochtitlan, Moctezuma's city, the beating heart of Aztec Mexico. Our trek will take us through most of the towns and landscapes described by our two eyewitness guides, Bernal Diaz del Castillo and Cortez himself. It will end with that momentous encounter on a causeway in Tenochtitlan, November of 1519, Cortez and Moctezuma, the last Tlatoani of Aztec, Mexico. It was 1980 when I first read Bernal Diaz, so I was, what, 35? About the same age as Cortez and Diaz when they began their march to Tenochtitlan. And I can remember my outrage, that youthful child of the 60s, indignation at the gangster Cortez and his cabal for having brought so much destruction to Mexico. Forty years later, considering how emphatically advancing years were catching up with me, physically and mentally, I could only wonder, would I even make it? In fact, as I begin my march to Mexico City, I am more than twice the age of either Cortez or Diaz in 1519, and reading them anew, I can only marvel at the sheer audacity and and yes, make no mistake about it, courage that these gangsters must have had this grungy brotherhood of 600 in the face of hundreds of thousands of Indian combatants prone to human sacrifice, not to mention rumors of cannibalism, and of course, no maps, no Apple Play, no GPS. On the other hand, in 2019, I was actually more alone than they were. One man, one camera, an old man, a grandfather, to Dylan and Alexander, who would, unbeknownst to them, help me out from under that what, that, that odd nostalgia again, for something missing, something never experienced, impossible to experience. And yet, even as they are a mere thread back to the essence of a nearly extinct pre-Columbian reality, if not for all the wounds inflicted upon it, on this, the new world by the old, the old world of my ancestors, these two kids who are to me today, as if I have known them all my life, would likely have never been born. And so it was with them that I traveled to the source of their Taino DNA, 
to the Dominican Republic and its capital, Santo Domingo, the oldest continuously occupied European settlement in the New World, and the capital of Old Hispaniola, the crossroad of so much of what would come to pass in Old Mexico. In 1504, just 12 years after Columbus first landed here, Hernán Cortés arrived, precisely where Abuelo Pedro Curiel was born in 1956, grandfather to Dylan and Alexander, and almost certainly of Taíno blood. Who knows? Perhaps he also carries DNA of the original brothers of the conquest. Okay, so Hernán Cortés de Monroy y Pizarro. He was born in 1485 of a modestly noble family in Medellín in southern Spain. We know that very soon after the New World discoveries, maps were being published all over Europe, and a teenaged Cortés would surely have been attracted to this call of the wild. In 1504, with less than two years of higher education, Hernán Cortés, 18 years old, quit Medellín and came here. Unfortunately, much of what Cortés encountered here in 1504 is gone, because in fact, two years earlier, everything built here by the Spanish since 1492 had been destroyed by a major hurricane, the word hurricane, by the way, being a Taino Indian word. This structure behind me, the city's main cathedral, is the oldest in the Americas. It had been commissioned by Pope Julius the year that Cortés arrived and not completed until 40 years later. Cortés, however, the first thing that he needed to do upon arrival was to register with the colonial government as a citizen. This gave him the rights to a plot of land and with it an encomienda. An encomienda was a commission issued in the name of the Spanish crown that was essentially a license to steal both the labor and the lives of other humans, slavery. Of course, the Taino Indians, the slaves, had preceded the Spanish here by thousands of years, yet this complicated often brutal, always self-righteous communal slave system survived well into the 1700s. But sooner or later, Cortes would want to up his status in New Spain. He did this as a volunteer in the ongoing conquest of Cuba. This was in 1511. By 1519, 15 years after having left Spain, Cortes was serving as mayor of the newly founded city of Havana. And it was in Havana that Diego Velázquez governor of Cuba, chose Cortés to captain an expedition to assist the ongoing subjugation of the Maya peoples on the Yucatán. Cortés responded with vigor. He quickly collected some 600 men and 11 ships for the task. But just as he was about to set sail, he suffered a falling out with Velázquez, who then changed his mind and ordered the younger man to stand down. Cortés, in a move that would characterize his entire career, simply ignored the governor. In February of 1519, he departed Havana with his ships, his men, and 13 horses. He continued on to the Yucatán and made landfall in what is now Tabasco, on the saddle of the Yucatán. Famous today for these monumental heads, carved by the more ancient Olmecs, it was here that Cortes and his men, for the first time in Mexico, came under attack. It was also on the Yucatan that Cortes found a Franciscan priest, a Spaniard by the name of Geronimo de Aguilar. Aguilar had been captured by the Maya eight years earlier, after a shipwreck. Importantly, during his long captivity as a slave, he learned the Chantal Maya language. This was crucial because just days later, Cortés would encounter certain hostile tribes in Tabasco whose chieftains, after accepting a quick defeat, gave Cortés a parcel of young indigenous women. These were the first gift of women and girls that Cortés would receive in Mexico. Many more would follow, of course, the vanguard of a modern Mexico and its distinctive mestizo culture, but amongst them was La Malinche, the soon-to-be mistress of Hernán Cortés, and the mother of his first-born son, Martín. Instead of huddling on deck, however, as the other girls did, she took to prowling the deck, 
asking every kind of indecipherable question about everything she saw. Diaz recalls her that day as of good appearance, a busybody, and very forward. But, importantly, Malinche was Nahua, thus fluent in the Aztec language, and because she also spoke Chantal Maya, Cortés could now communicate with the Aztecs through her and the Spanish priest Geronimo de Aguilar, who also spoke Mayan. Though Cortés, in his letters to Spain, never mentions by name La Malinche, or Doña Marina, as she was christened upon her conversion to Christ, Diaz does, and more than once. It was through her only, under the protection of the Almighty, that many things were accomplished by us. Without her, we never should have understood the Mexican language, and upon the whole, have been unable to surmount many difficulties. As one can imagine, then, her reputation in modern Mexico is a maelstrom of dramatic tensions covering the entire spectrum from traitor and prostitute to savior and founding mother of the nation. Leaving the Yucatan, the small fleet continued north. They landed on an island now called San Juan de Olua, within easy sight of the modern city of Veracruz. The formidable structure we can visit today dates to more than a hundred years later, but it was on this island in April of 1519, Easter week in fact, that Cortes made first contact with the Aztecs. We had hardly arrived when we espied two large canoes, which are here called pirogis, filled with Indians and making straight for us. They climbed on board without any ceremony and inquired of our Tlatoani, which in their language means leader. Doña Marina immediately understood their question and pointed to Cortes. The Indians graciously received Cortes, then asked what he wanted, why was he here? Provisions for his men, he answered, disingenuously of course, and provisions he got. A couple of days later, more Indians arrived, sent by Moctezuma himself. They were soon treated to the first Catholic Mass, celebrated in Mexico, an Easter Sunday Mass no less, with tall white men plunging to their knees, uttering strange oaths. Cortes then hosted an Easter feast, wine and tablecloths included, after which he gave his stump speech as the humble servant of the greatest lord of the universe, Charles V, from whom he, Cortes, must deliver a message directly to the great lord of Mexico, wherever he is. So, where is he? At this, one of the chiefs whose difficult name the Spanish truncated to Tendile had to object. You have hardly arrived here, he said, and you want to speak to our Lord Moctezuma? Receive this present, please, which we give you in his name, and afterwards you will tell me what you want of him. And so it was from this cacique, Tandile, that Cortes first learned about Moctezuma and his island city. The Aztecs had arrived in the high valley of Mexico a little more than 200 years previous. A Mexica population descending from the north, they gravitated to the shores of the already settled Lake Texcoco. They called themselves the Tenochca, and even as their language was the same Nahuatl as the other Mexica peoples, they were shunned by the lakeside towns, forcing them to take refuge on the lake itself, on an island. Within a hundred years, the Tenochca would grow that island to be the dominant city of the entire valley of Mexico. They named their city Tenochtitlan. But if our conquistador was getting a sense of how important Tenochtitlan was in this terra incognita, he had also begun to understand how he might work an advantage here. He ordered a chair be brought out, and not just any chair, but an armchair beautifully painted and adorned with precious stones. He addressed Tendile. I said, this chair is for their monarch Moctezuma, that he might sit in it when I should pay him a visit. The chair is a present, I said, from the Spanish Emperor Charles, as a proof of the esteem in which he held him. Yes, said Tendile. Moctezuma was delighted with the arrival of such courageous men. 
He wished also very much to see our great emperor, such a powerful monarch of whom, although residing at such a vast distance, he had already gained some knowledge, and Moctezuma would soon send him a present of valuable stones, and was ready to furnish us with everything we might require during our stay. But as for Cortes calling upon Moctezuma, we had better give up all thoughts of that, as it was not necessary and would be accompanied by only the greatest difficulties. Moctezuma's imperial governors departed satisfied that the quantities of gold given to the strangers had bought them off. Little could the Aztecs yet appreciate that gold would only wet the conquistadors' dreams of conquest. Tendile would later, in fact, shuttle between Cortes and Moctezuma at least two more times, his message always the same and always cordial. An audience with Moctezuma was out of the question. But with each visit, the Aztecs brought exquisite gifts from Moctezuma, an expression of not only peace, but also, in the Aztec mindset, of power. The strangers, however, misunderstood these gifts. They saw only fear and weakness. As it happened, a couple of days after Tendile had departed for Tenochtitlan, Cortes and company were on the mainland, where I am now, directly across from San Juan de Alua. And there, they were very cautiously approached by men from a nearby tribe. Diaz picks up the story. These people, in both dress and language, differed entirely from the Mexicans that Moctezuma had sent to our camp. They all had large holes bored in their underlips in which they wore pieces of either blue speckled stone or thin plates of gold. And they spoke Totonac, a language quite different than the Nahuatl tongue of the Aztecs, but two men did know the Aztec tongue, and from them, Doña Marina, La Malinche, quickly understood the deep hatred that the Totonacs had for the Aztecs. So, Cortes wanted to know, Moctezuma is your enemy, indeed, to the death. And so, does Moctezuma have other enemies here also? Innumerable, the entire country hates the Aztecs. With this, he was beginning to assay the soft Aztec underbelly, the hatred that almost all the surrounding peoples had for the Aztecs. From this moment on, Cortes was absolutely convinced he was going to Tenochtitlan. But there was dissension in his ranks, some men openly demanding a return to Cuba, and soon back to their families and the comfort of their estates. Had not 35 of their number already died in battle, and now about to face tens of thousands of Aztec warriors? They also knew, as Cortes did, that his nemesis in Cuba, Diego Velazquez, the governor, had expressly prohibited Cortes to settle in Mexico. But Cortes had, in fact, early on promised his men that he would, meaning that the gold already received and more to come would lawfully belong to the colony and to Cortes, and not to the greedy governor. Cortes then feigned as if to give up on the colony and let the malcontents leave. The gambit worked. Diaz and others vigorously abraded him. Cortes relented and promised to found a colony. But only if they nominated him chief justice and captain general. And what was worse, that a fifth part of the gold, which remained after deducting the fifth for his majesty, should fall to him, Cortes. This was soon agreed upon with some reluctance, and a deed was drawn resolving that a town be founded. They called it Villarica de la Vera Cruz, the rich city of the True Cross, and would have been the first of three such cities of that name, except that it never really existed. And certainly not here, where I am now, in the last city of that name, the modern city of Vera Cruz. And it never existed because basically that town existed as a document only, which supported the rigged elections of officials. But it also was a document that established the legal standing of the expedition separate from that of Velazquez, meaning that Velazquez would no longer have a share of the booty. But finally, and most important, it established the legal structure of the conquest, 
rather dubiously, of course. This was called the Inquirimiento. El Requerimiento was a document that declares a fundamentally new state and with it a new social order. Interestingly, it was a tool the Spanish adopted from the Arabs during their conquest of Iberia. The Spanish updated it, of course, with the notion that since the New World belonged to no one, anyone could claim it as long as they promised to bring the true religion to the pagan inhabitants. After leaving some men behind to guard the ships, Cortes began his march to Tenochtitlan. He took with him 500 Spanish soldiers, 13 horses, and 15 cannons. But even more crucial than the weapons and steel that they had and the Aztecs had not, he took with him hundreds of native warriors, men from coastal polities who hated the Aztecs as much as he, Cortes, lusted after Aztec gold. He also had his consort translator, Doña Marina. For my trek inland, however, to the Aztec capital, instead of Doña Marina, I had Google Translate, plus Apple Play and Google Maps built into the steel frame of my rented Volkswagen Passat. How could I go wrong, I said to myself, out loud, in fact, as I happily left the airport rental lot in Veracruz less than 90 seconds later. 90 seconds. I was flagged by two policemen dressed in foreboding black demanding $360 for a totally bogus traffic infraction. After a full half hour, the three of us jousting via Google Translate, we settled on $200 American, cash, no ticket, no receipt. Wearily would I begin my route to Cortez, but before I did, in Veracruz, I first removed both the front and back plate frames that might advertise me as a rich gringo. On their first day out, the conquistadors marched north along the coast. We beheld the lovely shores and savannas, which were so many and so beautiful that as fruitful lands, in all of Spain, there could not be anything more peaceful to the eye. We then came to a deep river, which we crossed by means of some old canoes we found there, though I myself swam. On the opposite bank lay several small townships. They stopped here, a small village today called La Antigua, on the Rio de la Antigua. Unlike today, however, the conquistadors found the place empty, completely. But 12 Indians did finally show up. They carried with them some fowls and maize bread, which our interpreter said had been sent by their cacique, who desired we should visit his township which lay at a distance of one sun, or about a day's march. That would be the high fortress town of Keowitzlan, to which they proceeded. They also learned here that the road to Keowitzlan passed through Zempoala, the principal city of the Totonacs. But as they approached Zempoala, the Spaniards were intercepted by men who said that their chieftain was soon to arrive. Forever known as El Gordo, this fat cacique of chieftain, would play a key role in the conquest. After a ceremonial welcome, Cortes first had Doña Marina thank El Gordo for the abundance of his kindness. Then, as a veritable Don Quixote in the New World, he announced himself a vassal of the great Emperor Charles, who had dominion over many kingdoms and countries, and who uh, had sent us out to redress wrongs wherever we found them, and to punish the bad and make known his command that human sacrifices should no longer be continued. This lecture, according to Bernal Diaz, seems to have struck a chord, for the man sighed deeply and began to cry, but not as to repent the sins his guests had suspected of him, but rather to, to complain, complain most bitterly about Moctezuma and his governors. It was not long ago that he had been subdued by the former and robbed of all his golden trinkets. Moctezuma's sway was so oppressive that he dared not move without his orders. Cortes answered that he would certainly relieve the chief of this terrible oppression, but to do that he needed first to meet with this Moctezuma face to face. The following day the party continued up the coast to Keowitzlan, a large town of about 15,000. They arrived a day later, 
and found the town situated on a steep incline, making it difficult to lay siege to. But their worries were premature. As they were assembling their cannon, they were instead warmly received by the natives. But then, in the midst of this gracious welcome... It was announced that the fat cacique of Sempoala was approaching in a sedan chair. Immediately upon his arrival, the man renewed his complaints against Moctezuma, in which he was joined by the cacique of this township. All of them insisting that Moctezuma annually demanded great numbers of their sons and daughters, some to be sacrificed to their idols up there in Mexico, and that his tax collectors would take their wives and daughters and molest them here before their very eyes. They also claimed that upwards of 30 nearby townships were suffering like violence. Again, Cortes promised to end such oppression, but in due time. As it happened, however, that very hour, five Aztec tax collectors showed up. Cortes himself witnessed them traverse this central plaza without even looking at him, instead stopping to smell flowers while slaves cooled them with fans of green feathers. When finally introduced to Cortes, they haughtily informed him that he had no business at all in these parts, that the local caciques should have never accommodated him, and that Moctezuma will certainly be annoyed. The taxmen then told the townspeople that they must find 20 warriors and an equal number of females in order that by sacrificing them, they might appease the gods for the evil service which had thus been rendered. Hearing of this, Cortes privately told the Totonac caciques to gather up the Mexican taxmen as prisoners. The fat cacique was aghast, but our conquistador simply looked at him and laughed. Had I crossed the seas to defend you? Or rather to, to deliver you to the unjust pretensions of Moctezuma? But further, he commanded the caciques to no longer obey the mandates of Moctezuma, nor to pay him tribute, and to make this known to all the tribes with whom they were allied and friendly. With this bold move, Cortes was now seen as a teule, the Spanish version of a word that can mean either demon or god. And it was certainly this slippery ambiguity that gave the occupiers the space wherein they would later construct the abiding New World myth. And it survives to this day that Moctezuma believed Cortes to be their returning serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. But nowhere in his letters to Charles of Spain do we hear anything about this Quetzalcoatl. So was it then, after all, a construct of decades later, created to support the fiction that Moctezuma had surrendered to Cortes and simply gave his empire to King Charles, which would effectively mean that all subsequent resistance to Spanish rule was unlawful and treasonous? So what does he do next to Cortes? He secretly has two of the Mexican prisoners brought before him and greets them as if he, Cortes, had no idea why they were being treated so shabbily. He releases them. He then commissioned them to go and tell their monarch, Moctezuma, that we were all his sincerest friends and most devoted of servants. As darkness fell, these two men were secretly escorted out of town. When the local caciques learned of this apparent escape, Cortes fiend disgust and insisted that the remaining three prisoners be put under his guard, after which he released them and sent them also back to Tenochtitlan. This left the caciques of all the Totonac tribes certain that Moctezuma's army would soon be upon them. Cortes assured them otherwise. He said that he and his men with him would be their protectors and that he who dared to molest them should forfeit his life. Upon this, the caciques, one and all, promised to unite the whole of their armies the whole of their armed forces with ours. Before this, Cortes had likely some inkling as to how he might conquer the Aztecs, but his actions were mostly reactive, determined more by what happened day by day. Now, however, he was certain that the Aztecs had already weakened themselves by the ocean of tears they had inspired throughout Mexico. Thus, the question that historians have since posited, was this a clear-cut war of conquest, or rather, had the conquistadors stumbled into a nascent civil war.
With over 30 Totonac townships now allied with them against Moctezuma, Cortes fell upon the task of establishing a new city, La Via Rica de la Vera Cruz, the rich town of the True Cross. This should have been the second city of that name, but in fact it was the first, because the Ulia Via Rica, as already noted, existed on paper only. According to Diaz, this new Via Rica was established about 30 miles north of the port city of Veracruz and two miles from here, the hilltop fortress of Kiahuitzlan, from where we can easily see behind me the peninsula that once gave Spanish galleons protection from storms. Today, we find the lazy beach atmosphere of Playa Viarica, but hardly a mile away, up a slight rise, we can trace the meager ruins of that settlement. According to Diaz... First of all, we marked out the ground for the church and the market, then storage and other public buildings belonging to a proper town, and Cortes himself put the very first hand in carrying a basket of stones and earth on his shoulders and working at the foundations. But Moctezuma was soon to realize that his taxmen were sequestered somewhere up here in the Totonac Mountains and that all the tribes here were renouncing him. This was a grave insult. While a solution was being debated, however, two of the ex-prisoners showed up in Tenochtitlan. When Moctezuma learned that Cortes had freed them and sent them back to Mexico with the commission to offer his services, the monarch softened and resolved to make inquiries as to what our intentions were. Ambassadors were sent to Cortes along with gifts of great value. The conquistador assured them that he was there to serve Moctezuma and that, in fact, he had taken the tax collectors under his protection, not as prisoners. Now, seeing that the dreaded Moctezuma, rather than sending his vast army, had instead sent his highest nobility to greet Cortes, the fat cacique declared that Cortes was a friend for life. Methinks that after what has happened with the taxmen, these people look upon us as gods or some species of beings like their idols. Okay, so yes, there is confusion amongst the natives as to who these intruders were. But again, we see no reference at all to Quetzalcoatl. Then, after dealing with yet more discontent amongst his men, Cortes decamped and headed south, back to Sempoala. Arriving two days later, and after collecting another 2,000 Indian warriors, they continued on to La Antigua. And it was here, in La Antigua, where men aligned with Velázquez in Cuba did finally revolt. Wanting to return to Cuba, they commandeered a ship. Cortés intervened, had the leader hanged, and the feet of the ship's pilot chopped off. He claims then to have made an astounding decision to quell any further revolt. He ordered all the ships be scuttled and burned. Today, however, most historians agree that this burning of ships never really happened, that yes, the hardware was all removed, but that the ships were beached rather because of severe wood rot. And they seem to have been beached here at La Antigua, where the locals insist today that they were tied to this large tree directly behind me. Very near, in fact, the Casa Cortes, or the ruins of the house, where Cortes once lived here in La Antigua, up ahead. With the house here so much larger and better preserved, than anything we found at the Playa Rica site, we can assume that it served Cortes much longer. In fact, soon after the conquest, this settlement became the official site of Veracruz. He then called a meeting of all the neighboring caciques, all of whom by now in revolt against Moctezuma, and he forged an alliance with them. This proved to be crucial, and he likely knew it even then because before marching off... He adduced many beautiful comparisons from history, mentioning heroic deeds of the Romans. And we answered him, one and all, that we would implicitly follow his orders, that the die has been cast, that we were as with Caesar when he had crossed the Rubicon, and that everything we did was for the glory of God and his majesty, the emperor. Their best path inland, they decided, was to head south again to Zempoala, then up the Octopan River. 
In Zempoala, they were advised that on their way to Mexico to Tenochtitlan, they should visit the city of Tlaxcala, that the Tlaxcaltecas were deadly enemies of the Aztecs. But first, leaving Zempoala on August 16 of 1519, after a single day's march along the Octopan River westward, they came upon this, the small township of Jalapa. Jalapa is today a city of about 400,000. 70 miles northwest of the port city of Veracruz, it is in fact the capital city of the state of Veracruz. And aside from the famous jalapeno pepper, it also holds one of the most important anthropology museums in the country, right here behind me. Some of the famously enigmatic Olmec heads are here in Jalapa, displaced from their site of origin in Tabasco, very near, in fact, where Cortes first met his mistress translator, La Malinche. From Jalapa, they passed through Coatepec, which calls itself the coffee capital of Mexico, and it might actually have more coffee shops than churches, which is interesting because the coffee bean, as an old world migrant to the new, much like cheese and pork, and Christianity, is now so completely part of Mexican everyday life. Cortes then states they proceeded on to a settlement that Diaz named as Socochina. Historians believe that they were referring to a town we know today as Hico. As they were in friendship with the Sempoalans and paid no tribute to Moctezuma, we found the people here well inclined towards us. Thus, we erected a cross and explained its signification to the inhabitants and what great veneration was due to it. Next, Diaz reports, the expedition marched over a high mountain from Hico to Textutla, or what today is Ishuacan. And there, again, friendly natives, extremely unhappy with Moctezuma and the Aztecs. Diaz also records how suddenly the climate became so very cold, very different from the lushly tropical aspect of both Cuba and the Veracruz coast. Soon, however, with spacious highland valleys, surely reminding the men of the lonely plains of Castile, we can only imagine their thoughts running along the lines of so much beauty here, so very much like home. Why should not all of this belong to us rather than these heathens? Next up, the small township of Xocotla, today called Zautla, and still very small. They nonetheless made their approach with caution as the inhabitants, according to the advice of the Zempoalatecas, were aligned with the Aztecs. In fact, the local cacique here seemed eager for the Spanish to go home. He spoke of the great and strong city of Mexico, how it lay in the midst of the waters, and that it was only by means of bridges and canoes that a person went from one house to another, that every house had a balcony, and moats so completely isolating them that they might separately be considered as so many defensive castles. But this cacique also spoke of the great quantity of silver and gold. Cortes then delivered his requisite sermon regarding his holy religion, seeing it fall on deaf ears, he proposed to his men that they should at least erect a cross. But Father Olmedo suggested otherwise, arguing that as subjects of Moctezuma, the Indians would only desecrate it. In fact, one certain spot in this township I shall never forget. Situated near the temple was a vast number of human skulls piled up in the best order imaginable. There must have been more than a hundred thousand. I repeat, a hundred thousand. Today, the town of Zautla has less than 1,000 inhabitants. So we must wonder, how did 100,000 skulls ever find their way here, dead or alive? And where might they be now?
In classic jurisprudence, we have habeas corpus. Where's the body? In archaeology, we might wonder, where are the bones, the skulls? The fact is, the currently accepted evidence of human sacrifice in Mexico is based on individual excavations of bones that only rarely exceed the bones of a hundred people. From the local cacique, Cortes was strongly advised that his best path forward from Zautla would be through the large town of Cholula. But again, the Zempoalatecas with Cortes advised Tlaxcala instead. They insisted that the Cholulatecas were a treacherous people. And as Moctezuma had always a strong garrison there, we should instead choose the road to Tlaxcala, where the inhabitants were friends of theirs and sworn enemies of the Mexicans. Cortes heeded this advice, but upon nearing Tlaxcala and seeing an array of hostile warriors directly in his path, he stopped. And after consulting his men, he decided to engage the Tlaxcaltecas in a dialogue. But a dialogue was not forthcoming. Instead, a significant battle. The Tlaxcaltecas defended themselves right valiantly with their swords and lances, wounding several of our horses. But the blood of our men soon began to boil and we killed five Indians. Then a swarm of more than 3,000 rushed us and poured forth a shower of arrows. Somehow, the Spaniards were able to make forward gains, but were soon overwhelmed. Cortes ordered a halt. He called forth three previously captured Tlaxcalteca warriors and sent them back to the enemy with words of peace. When this failed, he ordered a massive barrage of firepower, killing many Indians, including three caciques. We had scarcely proceeded a quarter of a mile when we found the fields covered with warriors. They had large feather knots in their heads, waving their colors and making a terrific noise with horns and trumpets. In an instant, we were surrounded on all sides by such numbers of Indians that the plain, here six miles in breadth, seemed as if but one vast body of the enemy. A fierce battle ensued, wherein, incredibly, they lost only one man, but 60 were wounded, including Diaz. Cortes then quickly organized yet another peace overture. It too was rebuffed. Of what he did next, we catch him uh, bragging to his I men. torched more than a hundred villages, one of which had more than 3,000 houses. But as we carried the banner of the Holy Cross, God gave us such a victory that we slew many people without sustaining any injury ourselves. The Tlaxcaltecas did want an end to hostilities, the main obstacle being a disagreement between a blind man and his son. Xicatencatl the Elder was the Tlaxcalteca cacique. Xicatencatl the Younger was commander of the army. But every time the city's elders demanded that he, the young man, stop attacking the Spaniards, he ignored them. Amidst this discord, however, a delegation of ambassadors suddenly appeared in the Spanish camp and with them gifts from their young commander. But these men were very soon discovered to be spies, at least according to Cortes. Seeing this, I took all 50 of them and cut off their hands and returned them to their chief, ordering them to tell him that by day or by night, or whenever he might come, he would see who we were. This outsized cruelty somehow gave the Tlaxcalteca elders the leverage they needed. They forced their young commander to sue for peace. Ambassadors were sent to the Spanish camp, where they insisted that their hostilities had been because they knew the Totonac warriors, with Cortes, to be allies of the Aztecs. This they were sure of. They simply could not understand how the Totonacs might have turned against Moctezuma. Cortes, hopeful, remained cautious. I told him they should go and tell their chiefs to come hither in person or send me some better warranty of peace. Because if they refused to come, I would attack them at their very doors. <laughs> The 
The Spanish were then conducted into Tlaxcala, which Cortes described to his king. It is large and admirable, much larger than our Granada, and much stronger, having very good buildings. And it contains a great many more people than Granada does. With a population today of about 100,000, Tlaxcala in 1519 was the largest city that any European had yet to see in the Americas. For his part, however, Diaz was fascinated by the priests he saw here. Their hair was long and matted, completely besmeared with blood trickling down over their ears, for they had been sacrificing that very day. A mass was finally said with all of the caciques in the city in attendance. Presents were then duly made of females. At this, Cortez turned to Father Olmedo and suggested that this might be a good time to lecture the caciques about the abominations they practiced in the name of their religion. Diaz gives us Omedo's reply. No, there will be time enough when they actually do bring us their daughters. Then we shall have the best opportunity of telling them that we cannot accept them. When the young girls were finally presented, Cortez was grateful, but he insisted that the girls remain with their families. One of the caciques asked why, giving Cortez the opening to preach. According to Diaz, the cacique listened intently and with great respect, finally commenting upon this illustrious woman, meaning Mary the Virgin. We have heard all of this from you, he said, and willingly believe that this, your God, and this illustrious woman are right good beings. But you should reflect how very recently you have arrived in our country and you have but just entered our city. You should certainly give us time to learn more of your doings, your manner of behavior, and the nature of your gods. And when we shall have satisfied ourselves, respecting their qualities, we shall certainly make choice of those we consider best. The caciques went on to warn Cortes of the extreme danger awaiting him in Mexico, but then, according to Diaz, he heard more of what he claimed to have been hearing all along his march from the coast. About a certain god to whom they pay great honors, who had told them that there would one time come from the rising of the sun out of distant countries a people who would subject and rule over them. <laughs> He was referring, of course, to Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent of ancient Mesoamerica. But as already noted in all his letters to Spain, written during the conquest, Cortes makes no mention of Quetzalcoatl. It is seen now as a post-conquest distortion of local legend to justify the exploitation of heathen peoples. It is likely then that Diaz, writing 40 years later, had sensed the myth's proto-Christian implications and simply grafted it to his story. After several days in Tlaxcala, Cortes assembled his men and asked of them who was still of the heart to continue with him to Tenochtitlan. Diaz claims that such was the strength of his determination that even those previously reluctant did fall into line. Next up, Cholula. And no sooner had they settled in by a river, the Atoyac, just six miles from the city, ambassadors arrived to greet them. But there were no caciques among them, nor were they generous with food. In fact, for the three whole days there by the river, Cortes complained of less and less to eat. Which in itself reveals much about the Spanish mindset here in Mexico, an invading army complaining about not being fed. But in fact, Suspicions were confirmed when Zempoalateca spies with them reported seeing booby traps rigged around the town. The Tlaxcaltecas also reproached Cortes. But Cortes decided to at least approach the town. 
they were intercepted by caciques begging Cortés not to enter with the Tlaxcaltecas, their archenemies, they said. Cortés did relent, putting the caciques at ease, but he then fell into denouncing their idol worship and human sacrifice. Bernal Diaz reports that the caciques were quite taken aback. They said that we really demanded too much of them, that we had scarcely seen them before we required of them to abolish their teules, which they could not think of complying with. And they continued to insist that they had no evil intentions. And so the party moved into Cholula proper, where Diaz marveled at how the housetops and streets everywhere were full of people gazing upon them. But the city itself also impressed him. Cholula. But events were about to get bloody, leading to the most horrific day of violence of the expedition thus far. As it happened, that night, Doña Marina was befriended by a Cholula Teca woman. She was told that the city had sent away all their wives and children, and that many of Moctezuma's people were gathered close by and intending to fall upon us and kill us all. She said that if she wished to escape, she should leave with her. The woman even offered Doña Marina her second son in marriage. Instead, she brought the woman to Cortez. Cortez heard her out, then sought counsel of his men. I think the Mexicans would play us worse tricks in other places. And as we now have a footing in their vast territory, it would be better for hostilities to break out here and now. They decided to preemptively attack the Cholula Tecas the next morning in the spacious courtyard adjoining their headquarters. In fact, this courtyard, attached to the ex-convent of San Gabriel here, just paces from the Zocalo, is the likely site of what is now called the Massacre in Cholula. At the agreed-upon hour, Cortés on horseback Doña Marina, at his side, severely upbraided the Cholulateca caciques assembled before him, suggesting how willing they were to see him and his men dead so that they could gorge themselves on their flesh. Why? I asked them, did they wish to murder us all? We had done them not even the smallest injury. When the Cholulatecas heard this, as interpreted by Doña Marina, they confessed that it was not them who conspired against the Spaniards, that everything had been done at the instigation of Moctezuma's ambassadors, to which Cortes answered, Spanish laws do not allow such treachery to pass by unpunished, and that they would be punished for it with the loss of their lives. At this moment, I ordered that cannon to be fired. This was the signal. According to Diaz, a great battle ensued, and within the course of a couple of hours, with the help of the Tlaxcalteca warriors, some 3,000 Cholulatecas were slaughtered here in this courtyard. Some believe it was as many as 20,000. But so horrifically did the Tlaxcaltecas continue to kill the hated people of Cholula that Cortes finally ordered them out of town. On the other side of this coin of violence, we know that after the conquest, a commission was sent from Spain to investigate crimes that Spanish troops may have committed here in Cholula. Diaz responds with a classic blame the victim dismissal. I myself heard the very pious Franciscan brother, Toribio Motelmea, say that while it would certainly have been better to have avoided spilling so much blood in Mexico, in fact, the Indians had given us the cause to do so. And it did have this good effect, that all the inhabitants of New Spain are now convinced that their idols were nothing but deceitful demons. <laughs> residents here today do insist that Cholula has as many churches as days in the year. But the premier church of Cholula is this one. Erected after the conquest, it occupies the summit of what is the largest pyramid in the Americas. Indeed, as an earthwork pyramid, laced as it is with several miles of tunnels, it rose over centuries in layers, multiple layers, the first one built to one at Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent. 
When the Spanish arrived, however, the uppermost altar had by then been dedicated to the goddess of nine reigns. Thus it was that after the conquest, Spanish Catholics co-opted the healing reigns and built their sacred altar to honor the Virgin of the Remedies. Cortez and company stayed two weeks in Cholula, long enough to see the streets and markets once again, remarkably, filled with enterprise. It was as if nothing had happened. Satisfied with what they had accomplished here, they moved on. Within a day's march, they found themselves approaching Cuello Cinco, today a town about nine miles on the other side of Cholula. In pre-Hispanic times, it was likely more populous than many cities in Spain. Cortes was, of course, pleased when all the caciques in the town readily came out to greet him. We were well received by them, and who gave me some female slaves, some wearing apparel and certain small pieces of gold. But more importantly, he discovered the town to be a stronghold of resistance against Aztec domination. In fact, such was the fear of Moctezuma that all of the caciques in the town gave the same dire warning to Cortes, do not go to Mexico. We can only imagine the conquistador's smile, surely a mixture of uncertainty, of wonder, of impatience, as he lifted his gaze toward the volcanoes that separated him from Moctezuma. Huejotzinco is today about 7,000 feet above sea level. Higher up, at 11,000 feet, is El Paso de Cortes. Between two volcanoes, it is the gateway to the Valley of Mexico. Climbing to the pass, Cortes stopped in Calpan, today San Andres Calpan. Just a village, really, but the site of this impressive ex-convent. One of the first convents in Mexico, Franciscan, it also was, as in Huayotzinco, constructed of stone quarried from indigenous temples nearby. Myself, leaving Calpan, I came upon this monument celebrating the myth of the twin volcanoes up ahead. Popocatepetl, the smoking mountain in Nahuatl, is here, the warrior. In his arms, his dead beloved, Istasihuatl, meaning the white woman. But symbolic of the other snow-covered dormant or sleeping volcano, is she really dead or just sleeping? My climb to El Paso de Cortes was the most difficult part of my Cortes adventure. 17 miles below the pass itself, my Apple CarPlay gave out, meaning that now no GPS and of course no phone service, I was completely alone. I encountered not one other person during that whole time. And it was 17 miles of, aside from some sand here and there, was mostly rocks, sharp rocks, sharp enough to cut one of my tires. It didn't flatten, thank you. But here, sitting alone, halfway up one of the volcanoes, it brings to mind Ordas, a lieutenant of Cortes, who was given the task of climbing to the active volcano at the time and to climb down into the crater to find sulfur for gunpowder, which they would need in abundance when they finally encountered Moctezuma and Tenochtitlan. It turns out that Ordas was the first European to descend into that crater, at least the first European. But it does make me wonder.
Hola. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Sí, sí, bien. Gracias. Yes, so Ordas, it does remind me that he was at least half my age. I am 75 now. And I don't think, I know I cannot take another step upward from where I am now. And so this is where I will wait for my comrades to descend. Inshallah. Inshallah. I had, in fact, that day joined three students at the visitor center below who were on their way up Ista Sihuatl, this, the sleeping volcano. And much too exhausted to continue, I did have to stop and wait for them to return. And they did. See? <laughs> the worst part is going down. Later, down below, as I mounted my Volkswagen, I imagined Cortez also mount up, then with his two or three hundred kinsmen, dozens of slaves, and several thousand Totonac and Tlaxcalteca warriors, all behind us. I descended with him, separated by some five hundred years, into the valley of Mexico. And descending, we can only imagine what dreams Cortez entertained, as for me so very tired, there was only the dream of sleep. But we pushed on, all of us, and made it to a Meca Meca, where the lord of the town housed us well, and gave me some 40 female slaves and 3,000 Castellanos. Castellanos, meaning gold, and a Meca Meca, still very much here, but today with its church and where they and I also stopped for the night. Later, walking around, instead of gold, I was mesmerized by these ladies making handmade tortillas. After buying some fruit, I returned to my lodging and laid down for a late afternoon nap and slept for 12 hours straight. Then more Mexican ambassadors showed up with more presents from Moctezuma and with a promise of more to come. Cortez definitely saw weakness here, and perhaps it was. or. Was it coming from within the Aztec mindset of supreme confidence, a judicious display of wealth and power? But the monarch did commit himself, at least according to the conquistadors, to an annual sum delivered to wherever Cortes wished, but only if Cortes turned back. Moctezuma altogether forbids us to enter into Mexico, they said, as all his troops are under arms to oppose you, on top of which the only access to the metropolis is by one narrow causeway, and we could not supply you with provisions there. To this I smiled and embraced Moctezuma's men as if they were long lost friends. And I chided them as to how often their great and powerful monarch, who styled himself our friend, could so easily change his mind. Moctezuma should instead place himself in my position and consider that if he had sent you as ambassadors to a monarch of his own rank, how would he like it? If you return home after arriving almost at his palace without once seeing that monarch, would he not look upon you as cowards? Cortes sent the ambassadors back to Moctezuma and resumed his march. But as they were entering into potentially very hostile territory, they proceeded entirely with caution. They stopped, finally, just short of Iztapalapan, a town built half on the hill and half on the lake. Early the next morning, a swarm of Mexicans were seen approaching. With them was the nephew of Moctezuma. This was Prince Cacamatzin of Tezcuco, who entered the Spanish camp in such splendor, a clearly astonished Diaz realized that this was the first time that they had seen a real Aztec chief. Continuing on with the prince, the Spaniards were taken aback by the crowds of curious inhabitants that surrounded them such that they could hardly move forward. 
The next morning brought them to the broad high road leading into Ixtapalapan proper. We were quartered here in palaces of large dimensions, surrounded by spacious courts built of hewn stone and of cedar and other sweet-scented wood. The gardens adjoining the palaces were astounding, and the numbers of trees of the most delicious odors the rose bushes, many different flower beds, and the fruit trees which stood along the paths. There was likewise a basin of sweet water which was connected with a lake by means of a canal constructed of stone of various colors and decorated with figures. And it was from here that the conquistadors could now clearly see how splendorous a realm the capital was. In the distance, Tenochtitlan, as if levitating over the shimmering waters of Lake Texcoco and accessed by only four causeways. The following morning, in the company of Prince Kakamatsin, they mounted one of these elevated causeways that Diaz insists was eight paces in breadth and running straight as an arrow into the heart of the Aztec world. At regular distances, we passed over newly built bridges until before us, in all its splendor, lay the great city of Mexico. And we who were gazing upon all this, passing through innumerable crowds, were a mere handful of men, our minds full of the warnings which the inhabitants of Huetzalcinco, of Tlaxcala, of Talmanalco had given us urging us not to expose our lives to the treachery of the Mexicans. Thus, I safely ask the kind reader to pause a moment and ask whether he thinks any men in this world had ever ventured so bold a stroke as this. They soon arrived at the intersection of a canal leading to Coyoacan, a Nahuatl word meaning place of the coyotes. It is where, in fact, Cortes lived after the conquest, far enough away from Tenochtitlan, while his workmen were busy destroying it. Coyoacan is now the fashionable neighborhood where Frida Kahlo once lived with her husband, Diego Rivera, here in Casa Azul. Rivera, of course, famous for his murals of the conquest in Mexico City's National Palace. But closing in now on his prey, and claiming that as many as a thousand noblemen came out to greet him, all of them richly dressed, Cortez chafes with impatience. And when they had come, each one approaching me, but before speaking, would use a ceremony which is very common amongst them, of putting his hands on the ground, and afterwards kissing the ground. Just beyond one more bridge, it was announced that Moctezuma was approaching. Diaz reports his first sighting. He was surrounded by other grandees of the kingdom and seated in a sedan of uncommon splendor. Then, at a place not far from town, where several small towers rose together, the monarch stopped. As he raised himself up, Caciques supported him under his arm, while others held over his head a canopy of exceedingly great value, decorated with green feathers and gold and silver and pearls, all hanging down from a type of border altogether curious to look at. Moctezuma was sumptuously attired and had on a type of half boot, richly set with jewels, with soles made of gold solid gold. In contrast, the other lords were all barefooted. But they were also most richly clothed, and with them there were many other grandees around the monarch, some holding the canopy, others tending the road before him, sweeping, spreading cotton cloths on the ground so that his feet might never touch bare earth. As uh, we approached each other, I descended from my horse and was about to embrace him, but his lords in attendance prevented me with their hands. 
that I might not touch him. But Diaz remembered it a bit differently, almost like a dance. After Cortes alighted from his horse and advanced to meet him, many compliments were passed on both sides. Moctezuma bid Cortes welcome, who, through Doña Marina, said in return he hoped his majesty was in good health. And uh, if I still remember rightly, Cortes, Marina next to him, tried to concede the place of honor to the monarch, who, however, would not accept of it, but conceded it to Cortes instead. But after he had first spoken to me, all the other lords who formed these two processions all saluted me, one after the other. And then, as I approached to speak to Moctezuma, I removed my necklace of pearls and glass diamonds and put it on his neck. And after we had walked along together, one of his servants appeared, carrying two necklaces wrapped in cloth. They were made of colored shells and golden shrimps executed with great perfection. Moctezuma took the necklaces and put them both around Cortez's neck, continuing on walking hand in hand. They arrived at a large and palatial residence. Having already been prepared as lodging for his guests, it was in fact the home of Moctezuma's deceased father, Ashayakatel, sixth Tlatoani of Tenochtitlan, Moctezuma being the seventh. Moctezuma then took me by the hand and led me into a spacious room. It was in front of the court where we had just entered. There, he made me sit on a very rich platform, which had been made specially for me, and told me to wait there. And then, he went away. And not one of his entourage ever looked at him, ever full in the face. Everyone in his presence stood, eyes downcast. It was only his four nephews and the cousins who supported him that dared look up. Diaz goes on to observe writing some 40 years later and with more than a hint of doubt concerning the enterprise of conquest, that of all the splendor without equal he had ever seen anywhere in this world before or since. There is now not a vestige of any of it remaining. Nothing, not even a stone of this beautiful town is now standing. It was November 8th of 1519 that day, as the conquistadors watched the royal procession recede. And they all, each of them, took note of the stately pace, the retinue of heads bent forward, eyes daring not to look up, sweepers clearing a path, an altogether unbelievable display of deep veneration of an all-powerful, graceful, exceedingly polite Moctezuma, 7th Tlatuani of Aztec, Mexico, less than eight months later, June 29, 1520, he would be dead, and with his death, the birth of modern Mexico. After much bloodshed, Tenochtitlan, in October of 1521, fell to the Spanish. Then the demolition began. And so we ask, after all the splendor Cortes had observed there, what happened in Tenochtitlan? What did he see that demanded such complete destruction? 
something about Moctezuma himself, perhaps, and Aztec culture, which, even with all its barbarities, might simply have been too attractive, too seductive, to let stand, something so deeply challenging that he could not but cancel. Of this, we will never know, nor need to know, because ultimately, history is a story always, an assembling of order out of the whirligig of memory that some argue is fiction and not at all about the past, but in fact a reveal, a document, a documentary of the present and the present state of mind of those who narrate our histories.